I think functional esophageal disorders are a very important part in clinical practice. Unfortunately, I think it is true that this has not been the focus of a lot of um, drug development from the industry part, uh, <coughs> and perhaps this is because the esophageal field has been moving tremendously rapidly with new technology and new concepts, and uh, the challenge has been for this company to bring, uh, for this uh, committee to bring that into the criteria. So the contents of the functional esophageal disorders chapter is an introduction and then five diagnostic categories uh, which are listed here as they will be listed in the chapter and this is in decreasing order of prevalence. Um, so non-cardiac chest pain is probably the most prevalent condition here and functional dysphagia the least prevalent one. Functional heartburn, we heard before. Functional reflux sensitivity is a new entity. I'll come back to that later. Functional globus and then functional dysphagia. And in the discussion of the pathogenesis of symptoms in all of these or in many of these conditions, esophageal hypersensitivity is conceptualized as a very important mechanism. And that's why there's a separate section on esophageal hypersensitivity mechanisms and the concept. Um, written into the chapter. The key points of the functional esophageal disorders chapter is that there's five functional esophageal disorders, four old ones, and one seemingly new one called functional reflux hypersensitivity as the fifth one. But it's not as new as it seems. This replaces the acid sensitive esophagus from the past. Now, what was acid sensitive esophagus? These are people who have symptoms of heartburn related to acid reflux. But the number of acid reflux episodes that they have and the characteristics are within the physiological range. So this is these are patients who have acid exposure just like anybody else without symptoms but who feel it. Why has this been turned into acid uh, to reflux to functional reflux hypersensitivity because now technology allows to measure non-acid reflux as well um, and that is a player the weakly acidic or non-acidic reflux events either basally prior to treatment or on therapy that's why the term functional reflux hypersensitivity is in there then we have seen over the last decade a boom of diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis. It's a rapidly emerging, rapidly increasing condition which has to be put into the differential diagnosis of many of the functional esophageal disorders. For four of the functional esophageal disorders in the workup now it is said exclude eosinophilic esophagitis. Then the Esophageal motility assessment itself with high resolution manometry has changed tremendously. There's new categories, better technology. We're better at detecting major esophageal motility disorders, and these now need to be excluded in a number of conditions, for instance, in the functional uh, dysphagia syndromes. And then pH impedance, as already alluded, has become um, I think a big part of clinical practice and the measurement of non-acidic or weakly acidic reflux either on or off PPI uh, is an important factor. And so the last key point is that separate discussion on esophageal hypersensitivity but probably in the final ranking of the, in the final layout of the um, chapter this will move earlier in the chapter. So changes from Rome 3, the addition of functional reflux hypersensitivity, the exclusion of eosinophilic esophagitis and major motility disorders. Functional chest pain before was termed of presumed esophageal origin, but this is not used in literature, and the current propos proposal is just to shorten it to functional e chest pain. And then functional heartburn, there are some qualifiers now. What is functional heartburn? Is heartburn without any evidence that this has anything to do with reflux. So basically it means sophisticated reflux monitoring, pH impedance, um, and symptom marker by the patient, I have heartburn now, and this is temporarily unrelated to any reflux event. They added now that there's no symptom relief despite optimal anti-secretory treatment, because if you do that kind of measurement and the patient has clear heartburn episodes not related to any reflux, 
but then become dramatically asymptomatic under PPI therapy, then I think you have a conceptual problem. So that is amended by saying no symptom relief with optimalized anti-secretory therapy, and also lack of evidence that reflux or eosinophilic esophagitis are the cause of the <coughs> The other thing that has been seen for globus is there's now two controlled trials in the literature that show that if you have a gastric inlet patch, so this is a patch of gastric mucosa high up in the esophagus, and you ablate that with endotherapy, globus may disappear. So the gastric inlet patch should not be there. There's a new uh, development for functional globus. And for functional dysphagia, um, in the previous criteria, this was mainly aimed at ruling out achalasia and other primary motor disorders. Now, this is broadened a little bit to say there needs to be evidence of lack of esophageal mucosal or structural abnormality. So the chapter is far evolved. There is some overlap that they need to look at um, and some overlap between sections, especially in description of the role of visceral hypersensitivity and incorporating that section and putting everything in that section on the mechanisms and uh, characteristics of esophageal hypersensitivity. They need to add a couple of figures and tables and finalize some discussions and agreements. And uh, it has been suggested that perhaps functional reflux hypersensitivity is not the going to win the beauty prize of a new name, so perhaps they could come up with something else there. And some of the management algorithms need to be updated and cleaned. And that's about it for this chapter.